Good evening. Welcome to our Bible class. Glad to have you with us tonight. Call your attention to Ephesians chapter 6 and the great passage on the armor of God. We'll start reading in verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of my might, of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, obviously, there's human opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. To Paul, that was very insignificant. Behind the human opposition is a satanic, demonic opposition. And that's what he addresses. Wherefore, take unto you the whole of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on a breastplate of righteousness. So far, we've been to that verse. The new verse is the next one. And your feet shod in gospel of peace. Father, help me to speak and each of us to hear uh, all your truth that you have for us tonight. Uh, guide by your spirit, this class, and accomplish your purposes in each one that's here and those that will listen online. In our Lord's name we pray. Amen. I saw something online today. Yeah. This person said, if the Apostle Paul saw the church today, we would be getting a letter. Yeah. thought that was pretty clear, clever. When Paul saw problems, he addressed them. He was an apostle, but he did a lot of pastoral work to save people. And the reason we'd be getting a letter, one of the reasons is an awful lot of people that say they're Christians are walking around unarmed in the middle of a battle in a war zone without any armor on. We certainly need to know who we are, who our enemy is, and what we're supposed to be doing. Paul's talked about the Christian's walk and the Christian's warfare and the Christian's witness, and we are in the warfare part and you can imagine uh, uh, in a firefight day, uh, uh, someone's not firing their weapon. They're in the fight, but they're not firing their weapon. They're, they're seeking for cover, and they're not calling in artillery or the, the, the airplanes. It's pretty basic in warfare, right? If you're in a firefight, fire your weapon. Seek cover, fire your weapon. Uh, call in an airstrike, call in the artillery. The artillery for the Christian is prayer. Prayer is our artillery. Are we calling in the artillery? Or are we just sitting there and taking it? Are we doing anything to protect ourselves and, and one another? Are we returning fire? All this is important stuff. And, uh, if you're saved, you're in the fight. You're not just in a fight, you are in the fight. I first wrote, you're in a fight, and then I realized, no, we're not just in a fight, we're in the fight. The enemy doesn't stop charging our lines. The enemy does not shoot, stop shooting his fiery darts. The enemy does not stop trying to knock us down, to back us off, or to run us over. And our country is about ready to get run over. 
our churches are getting run over. I read something. This woman was a political science, a philosopher. She was Jewish, German, and American. She was the first woman professor at Princeton University. She's writing about political stuff. And as an observer of mankind, she died in 1975, quite a while ago. But this is what she wrote. This constant lying, right? She's talking about politics and the state of our society. This constant lying is not to make people believe a lie, but at but endeavoring, endeavoring that no one believes anything anymore. A people that can no longer distinguish between truth and lies cannot distinguish between right and wrong. She's not writing as a Christian. She's writing as a observer of political affairs. And such a people deprived of power to think and judge, judge is, without knowing and willing it, completely subjected to the rule of lies. With such a people, you can do whatever you want. You know, Satan is a liar from the beginning and the father of it. He just keeps throwing the lies out. And people get skeptical and they just don't want to believe anything. They just... They think it's all crooked. So it's important to have what? The belt of truth. We've already looked at that. We've got to have the belt of truth. We've got to be girded with the belt of truth in a world of lies. Because Satan is a liar and the father of it. And the whole world lies in the evil one, according to 1 John 5. And it's important to have the breastplate of righteousness. It's interesting, unsaved people hold down the truth by unrighteousness. They push it down. They don't want it. Romans 1, 23, 1, 18, 28 to 32, all those verses... It's amazing that we, we're in a situation in this life where righteousness is ignored. God's righteousness is hated. God's truth is repressed because people prefer the truth to the lie. Or excuse me, the lie to the truth. So we got to have the belt of truth on. We got to have the breastplate of righteousness the very righteousness that people are holding down and holding back is something we have to have as our protection. I, and now we come to the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, this footgear for the Roman soldier was copied from the Greeks. And historical, historically, soldiers' footwear has been important. I was reading about an officer uh, in Vietnam, who was a platoon sergeant, not an officer, who believed that one of the most important jobs he had was to take care of his soldiers' feet. Think about the jungle. Think about wet feet. Think about jungle rot. Think about sores, open sores and wading through water. You could be out of commission pretty fast. You could step on something. So the, the Roman army understood something about that. And the sergeants in Vietnam, I guess, took care of the feet of their men. That was part of their... They felt that one of their bigger responsibilities. The Roman soldiers also had to be careful about their feet. If you can't march and you can't fight, 
What good are you? So you got to take care of your feet. This is a horrible person to quote from the pulpit, but Arnold Schwarzenegger one time said, take care of your feet. Heard him say that. And so I, I confess as a young person, I wasn't too careful about my feet. I remember many years ago, I was probably 18. We went swimming in the lake at Lake Atwood where my fish is. Is it Atwood? What is the lake there? Salt Fork. We were in Salt Fork Lake. And we weren't, we, 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 would, we were picnicking someplace. And my brother Bob and I decided we're not going to go down to the beach. We'll just dive in and swim around the lake. So we, and that, it was that time you were a teenager where you thought going barefoot was a great idea. And so we dove in the lake. It wasn't the beach. Nobody was swimming there but us. And we're swimming around having a good time. And we finally got clo back close to shore and I kind of put my foot, one foot barefoot down lightly, and part of it came on mud and part of it came on a bottle, a bottle. It was broken. Fortunately, the bottle was upside down. But it got my attention. It got my attention. Because if it had been the other way, I could have been injured fairly so I decided, okay, from now on, I'm going to wear swimming, swim shoes when I'm in a place where I don't know what's underneath the water. And uh, 24 years ago, I had shoes on, but it wasn't the right kind. For whatever reason, I had street shoes on. We were at Lake Cumberland in Kentucky at a family reunion. Everybody else went down to the lake. I stayed back. I've told this story before. And then I decided, I, I was talking to Linda's cousin for about 45 minutes, and then I uh, decided I better catch up with everybody else. They were all down the lake. I tried to take a shortcut. And we were probably, we were on a hill about 60 yards from the water, and it was going like this. And my feet went out from under me, and I slid down that gravel. I bet I slid 40, slid 40 yards. I tore up my legs, I tore up my knees, I was a bloody mess. I thought I was gonna knock myself out on a boulder before and, or, and drown in the water by myself and nobody's gonna know. Fortunately, by God's mercy, I was able to stop. But what was the problem that got me in so much danger? I didn't have the right foot gear. It was okay for walking around the campsite, we were camping, but it wasn't the right foot gear for me to do what I was doing. I lost my footing. Now put that in a battle, you lose your footing. And you're in trouble. I won't tell about, I didn't have any battle troubles, but I had some other instigations, one-on-one <laughs> -on -one or one-on-two, -on -two, where I lost my feet. You know, you got to keep your feet. Now, here, here, this comes with the great exhortation, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You needed shoes especially designed for warfare. They had theirs. We have ours. Your shoes, your footwear should uh, be appropriate for the activity you're dealing in. Golf shoes, tennis shoes, steel-toed boots, running shoes. <laughs> Footgear appropriate for what you're doing. The Roman soldiers had a sandal that they, where the foot was open, but it was designed for that occasion, and it had spikes in it so you could grip the ground like a football spikes, Mike. And they weren't designed, they were designed for standing and holding your ground. So the picture here is what? What is this um, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? There's a couple of possibilities here. Obviously, it means you are ready 
to stand for the truth and proclaim it. You are ready to stand for the truth and proclaim it. You're not off balance, so when you get hit, you're still standing. You, 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 you have your feet where they need to be, and your feet are properly covered so that you can take the blows and give blows as well. And there is a responsibility we have to proclaim the gospel of peace in the midst of satanic warfare. We ought to be quick to share our faith, as Peter puts it in 1 Peter 3.15. We, we ought to be able to give an answer to every man that asks of us a reason for the hope that's in us. Nothing makes, nothing makes us stronger than sharing our faith with other people. Don't hide your faith. I'm not saying we ought to be obnoxious. I think we have to bring up John 3.16 in every conversation. But we, we, God will give us opportunities, and we, we, need, we need to try to take them. And I will say this. There's no better way to learn the Bible than to get out there and talk to people who don't know it. You want to learn the depravity of man? Yeah, you can study good books on that, but you'll learn it when you witness in a way that you can't learn it outside of your study, inside your study. Uh, when you, you want to learn the depravity of man, the sufficiency of Scripture, learn that when you see what the Bible can do and people that are lost. You want to know the power of a gospel that's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes? Then proclaim it and see what happens. I read this statistic a long time ago, probably 20 years ago. I doubt if it's changed much. It said, this, this just a poll, and they just picked on the Southern Baptist. But it said 90% of the Southern Baptists never shared their faith last year. 90%. They didn't share their faith the whole year. And I'm sure that's not just true for Southern Baptist. But I, I think it was interesting statistic. And so if you're not sharing your faith, if you're not, if you don't have your your the, the your gospel shoes on, you're not standing, you're not learning the sufficiency of scripture. It, it, and you're not learning about the Bible truths confirmed in life as you interact with non-believers and believers, you're not as strong as you ought to be. If you're not witnessing, you're not, you're not just doing harm to the unsaved around you who need the gospel, you're harming yourself. You don't have the confidence. You don't have the, you're not battle-hardened. You're not battle-tested. You haven't had the truth of the Bible tried in real life. Uh, those that are do not witness are going barefoot in the conflict with the enemy. They don't have their feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, Many times, people will substitute, they'll invite people to church. A lot of churches are actually built on this model. People don't witness, but they do invite people to church. Now, obviously, their lives must have some kind of witness to it, or people wouldn't come when they invite them. But the idea that the church service is everybody you invite people and the preacher does all the witnessing is not a biblical model although it's a model in a lot of churches. And so what happens in a lot of churches, the church is filled with Christians with a sprinkling of unbelievers, and the pastor is preaching the gospel to the lost. Now, is that wrong? Well, no, it's not wrong. The gospel ought to be preached every Sunday. But you need something more. Church, the church service in Sunday morning 
is to exalt God and edify believers. That's his two main functions. And if you read 1 Corinthians 14, 22, it talks about if an unbeliever comes. They had unbelievers come to the service. But the church service was not primarily for reaching unbelievers. The church service was for worship of God and edification of saints who would go out and talk to unbelievers. So it's not wrong to have a gospel service that's primarily aimed at that. We're probably going to be doing that this next Sunday, the next couple of Sundays, because I'm right in that section where Paul's talking about the gospel. But to never go past that and evangelize the evangelized is not producing strong people. So it's very important. Ephesians 6 is addressed not to the pastors, not to the missionaries, not to the elders. It's addressed to the whole church, husbands, wives, children, parents, masters, servants, everybody. The whole group that he's been addressing in chapter 5 and chapter 4, he's now calling to arms and to be have the armor on in chapter 6. So may God help us to think this. We, our enemy is the devil, and he's shooting at us, and he's firing darts, and it's close in combat, and he's after us. we got to know how to handle ourselves. So you got to have the belt of truth, got to have the breastplate of righteousness, and you better have your feet shod with the gospel of peace. I saw something very interesting. It was a zebra. I saw plenty of zebras when I was in Africa, and I saw plenty of lions, but I never saw this. This lion was after this zebra, and it bit, bit, bit him two or three times, and he threw him off, and the zebra was actually getting in position. And that lion came from behind, and that zebra kicked that lion up into the air, way above his head. <laughs> and that, he was, that, that, that animal could take care of itself. And that lion's just going, <laughs> he's, he's, he's really had a knockout blow. He didn't know what hit him. Now, that was life or death. But that zebra had the he he had, he'd learned how to deal with lions. To get him to come behind you and kick with both feet, kick him into the next county, and that maybe they'll learn something. So uh, we have to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of, of peace. We're not to go barefoot in the conflict with the enemy without the gospel. Now here's where the gospel comes in. It's when every Christian is standing with the battle gear on. Every Christian, not just the leaders. So, here's where vulnerability comes in. Satan's watching who doesn't have armor. Why would you fight someone full armor if you can fight someone with no armor or a par armor? Right? Just like lions look for the weak or the old or the young. They're not going to pick on an adult if they can get to take a calf or something. So the Roman soldiers' sandals were designed for firmness and stability to stand to keep them from slipping or sliding. And so the gospel of peace is to keep us from slipping or sliding. Anybody here ever slip on the ice? Anybody ever slip in the bathtub? Anybody ever go across the sand on the beach and have it so hot it's burning your feet? Because you didn't bring any footwear. There's places where footwear is very helpful. <laughs> Few of us think enough about the benefits to ourselves when we continue to share our faith. We may not be very good at it. 
There may be many other people in the church a lot better. But we can tell people, we can invite them to church. That's good. But if there's an opportunity at the right time, we don't want to bug people. We don't want to harass people. We want to look for opportunities to talk to people about Jesus. And we want to make opportunities without being obnoxious, too obnoxious. And when we do that, we're going to find out how real Satan is. How blind people are. You know what's the real shocker? When you're dealing with someone with a very high IQ and very well educated, they are blind. I've told this before, but this was years ago, long before Linda and I were married. I witnessed to an OU professor about three hours. And then I witnessed the next day to a man who was epileptic and had spent his life in the um, hospital here in Athens, had been institutionalized, very limited individual. He'd have seizures and stuff. When they let the people out of the hospitals, I thought that was a good thing. The interesting thing was the response was the same. The same blindness that that man had and the professor had. The IQ was quite different, but the response was the same. You learn something about how lost people are. It's not because their IQ is smarter than anybody else. You can't escape lostness by your IQ. You realize how blind people are. You realize how real Satan is. You realize how shallow the case for unbelief really, really is. And they can make it sound really, really good that they're so smart and you're so ignorant and backward, but how shallow it really is. And you realize how powerful the gospel is. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I'll tell you something else, you realize how true the Bible is, not just because you read it in a book about the Bible or you read the Bible several times, but because the Bible describes our world and life in this world and people in this world the way it really, really is. There's an education. There is an enlightenment that comes from sharing your faith and standing for the Lord publicly. Remember Asaph? He said, my feet almost slipped. Psalm 73. And if you don't want to slip, and if you don't want to remember how Pilgrim was fighting Beelzebub in Pilgrim's Progress, there's a wonderful illustrated Pilgrim's Progress Pilgrim's on his back, and the dragon's on top of him. And the dragon says, I have you now! <laughs> Pilgrim didn't know jujitsu; He was in trouble. He's on his back, and the devil's on top of him. And uh, he reached out. He reached out with the sword. Gave it to him, didn't he? So it's very important for us to be armed. It's very important for us to hold our feet spiritually and if we do that, we will really appreciate what God's done for us more and more. Thank you, Lord, because I was as blind and as foolish and ignorant and as they are. 
I was holding down the truth in unrighteousness. I didn't have the breastplate of righteousness on. I was holding down the truth in unrighteousness. And I preferred the lie to the truth. How twisted is that? So part of the piece here is the gospel piece of being uh, justified with God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the peace, that's the objective peace. God's not at war with us anymore. We're not at war with God. Uh, Jesus is the king of peace. And uh, uh, what a blessed thing to have that. But the gospel, there's also this peace within that Paul's talking about. The peace of God shall rule your hearts. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 is subjective peace. And um, what a precious thing that is. So sure-footedness, the paradox, the paradox of the gospel of peace on a battlefield. And God demands peace on his terms, right? Isn't that Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4? Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Excuse me, verse 14. For he is our peace, who's made both one, this Jew and Gentile, and has broken down the middle law partition, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments or contained in the ordinances to make in himself too one new man, so making peace. The peace that comes in the gospel, it comes from the gospel of the, the Prince of Peace. And there's that objective peace with God, and there's that subjective peace that passes understanding. That gives us sure-footedness. What a paradox that in the invisible war, our feet are to be shod with the gospel of peace. All of this supposes a quarrel between God and men since the fall. And that those that come to know the Lord and remind themselves of that, I've got peace with God. God's not angry with me anymore. And if we hope to keep in the fight, we have to have that peace. With, we remind ourselves of the peace we already enjoy, and we have to be prayed up so that that peace that passes all understanding. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And turn to Philippians, right over the next book, very important passage, Philippians chapter 4. 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men, the Lord's at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I told you about my brother that had serious mental problems, and when my mom died first, and then my dad died, and my brother never lived by himself in his whole life. He was almost 60 years old. When my dad died, I thought he was going to have trouble. And I said, Tom, I'll stay with you tonight. So I stayed with him. I said, Tom, how you doing? Mom's gone. Dad's gone. How you doing? Tom was a Christian. He said, God's given me grace. What a blessing for me to hear him say that. So my brother, that was probably the darkest time in his life. He said, God's given me grace. 
And he was able to go through that until the Lord mercifully took him home not too long later after that. I mean, God is willing to be reconciled with us, but he's not willing to be reconciled with our sins. There is no peace to the wicked. And turn with me to Isaiah 55. This is quite important, Isaiah 55. There's full forgiveness, full reconciliation, and the reconciliation with God is not like Absalom and David, but there's terms to the rec reconciliation, and that's repentance and faith. God has his terms. We don't get to tell God at what terms we'll have a relationship with him. He tells us. He sets the terms. Psalm 55 and verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he'll have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my way, says the Lord. Look at the Middle East now. What do you see in the people over there? All they want to do is get back at the person that got at them, right? That's how men act that aren't saved. I'm not saying governments don't have a responsibility to people who are killed by outside. I believe that. But there's every man's hand against his brother attitude. It never ends. And, and it won't end until Jesus comes. But let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. we got to admit, I haven't been thinking right about God. I haven't been thinking about about myself. I haven't been thinking right about my my salvation. I haven't been thinking right about my sins. So let the wicked man forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he'll have mercy on him, and to our God he'll abundantly pardon. And God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. You people down there don't think like me. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, how do we get God's thoughts into our thoughts? Right here. Or as the rain comes down and snow from heaven and returns not there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth It'll not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it'll prosper in the thing whereto you sent it. Now, this is important if you're working with non-Christians. The most important thing you can do is give them one Bible verse and let God use that verse. They'll forget your arguments. They'll forget your illustrations. They'll forget everything, but God promises his word will not come back what? Void. The word is the sword of the spirit. And so we need to use the word <laughs> and not our own reasonings. And our, it doesn't mean we can't reason out a thought or anything like that, or give a testimony or anything like that. But if at all possible, use a Bible verse. Don't argue. Don't debate. Give them a Bible verse. And, and there's a ways to do it that's not offensive so that you're not preaching at them, so, so called. You can say, this verse changed my life. And then give them the verse. This verse opened my heart. Give him the verse. 
you know, just somehow get a verse in them. <laughs> and so it's important because it's a spiritual battle. It's not an intellectual battle alone. It's not even ignorance on their part and smartness or smartness on their part or on our part. It's spiritual. You can win the argument and lose the person. I've done that. I've learned that. I can win the argument and lose the person. Answered all their questions, put them in a box, can't get nowhere, but they still didn't get saved. Does that mean we never uh, engage in people intellectually? No, I didn't say that either. I'm simply saying, let the Word do it. It takes a lot of pressure off. Well, at least I got them, gave them a Bible. At least I got some of God's truth in them. Men are born again through the Word of God. Isn't that what it says? So, very important. And so God says, it's my Word that didn't come back void. And God's Word, there's terms in His Word about salvation. People have to repent and believe. Now, if it's possible, the Bible says, uh, uh, live at peace with all people, but it's not always possible. <laughs> but we try. But we don't want to be at peace with the devil, that's for sure. We don't want to be at peace with him. We want to be at war with him. But unless we, we, we need to have peace with God and know it, we ought to have assurance of salvation. But there also is this subjective peace that comes when we realize more and more that more and more this book is really true. This book works. This gospel changes people's lives. I want to, I'd like to illustrate some times when the early church, maybe Paul, maybe Peter, or the other Christians, used the gospel in a fight with unbelievers. Just want to show that, give some examples of that. And because they did, they kept their feet. They kept their feet. Their feet were shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's, it's good to keep your feet, unless you know jujitsu or you're a wrestler. But you know, you don't want to, you don't want the fight to go to the ground. And if you can keep your feet, people might back off. I had a guy back off trying to start a fight with me. Tried to th trip me three times, and fortunately he didn't. So he gave up because I was bigger than him. He still probably would have whipped me, but he didn't do that. So you got to keep your feet. And, and But one of the, it, it's important for us to, how do I keep my feet by using the gospel, the, 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 our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? How do you do that? Well, let's look. Let's go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. Everybody got it? And to him, this, they all agreed, this is to, uh, we're talking about Gamaliel. And when they called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. What were they doing? We're going to take your sandals. No more gospel here. You can't wear sandals in our temple. Can't wear sandals in our country. No more witnessing. That's what they said, right? They, they, they commanded them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let him go. So they departed barefoot. No, they departed from the presence of the council 
rejoicing they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. You see how this is, this was offense when they were preaching, but it's also defense because their first reaction was, do them what you say. We're going to obey the Lord, not men. That's what Peter told them earlier. And so the more they told them to stop, the more they did it. It's interesting, isn't it? And uh, in, you know, I'm not saying there is, shouldn't be discretion, uh, especially in some countries, but this was no time for discretion. This was a country that had the Bible. This is where people should have believed in the Messiah. There's no time for discretion here. These were the murderers of Jesus. They needed to hear it. The Jews needed to hear it right away. And what did Jesus say? Begin in Jerusalem. So they, had, they, they, they were told, don't be quiet. <laughs> don't go somewhere else. Start in Jerusalem. He wanted the people that killed him to hear it first. Other times it might be good to be discreet for many reasons, but it certainly wasn't in that reason, and they weren't in that case, and they weren't. And then finally, Saul makes havoc, chapter 8, verse 3. They killed Stephen, and they killed the first Christian. Saul's starting to make it bad for everybody else, and he entered into every house, hauling out men and women, committed into prison. Now, what'd they do? They were scattered. They didn't just let themselves be arrested, but they didn't let themselves be shut up either. They couldn't do it there, so they just left and did it somewhere else. Their feet were shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. They did it there and they disobeyed, and, and they did it there as long as they could, but it became obvious that they can't do it there anymore, so they went somewhere else and did it. But they did it. They kept doing it. You understand what, what we're saying? Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. And then in Acts 10, Acts chapter 10, verse... Um, On Acts chapter 10, of, um, start in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of truth, I perceive God's no respecter of persons, that in every nation he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted of him. The word of God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, He's Lord of all. What's Peter doing? He's got his feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, which means what? First time he ever preached to Gentiles. He thought, he thought I'll just preach to Jews. I'm not going to, uh, my job's just to find Jews and preach to them. But when the sheet came down, the food came down, and the command came down, Peter finally got it. All right, there's the. They're antagonistic, but there's other people. I'm going to these others now. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he's Lord of all. That word, that word of pre preaching peace, I say you know, was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John, how God anointed Jesus of the Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with power, he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him and were witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, and him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people this is chosen before by God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead and commanded us to preach to the people. What's he doing? He's preaching the gospel of peace, but now he's preaching it to Gentiles. He's getting stretched. I don't, Peter had never been in a Gentile's home. Never. Jews wouldn't go in a Gentile home because they believed that Gentiles aborted their babies and flushed them down the drain 
and they would be ceremonially unclean by going into a, where a body was. They wouldn't eat their food. We can go in their home. So Peter's getting stretched, isn't he? And he previously thought these people are hands off. But he's learning, no, God's pretty clear. I'm supposed to preach to them. And to him give all prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the mission of sins. And then the Holy Spirit showed up and the whole group got saved. Doesn't God surprise you who he saves? You ever been surprised about who got saved and who didn't get saved? Isn't that something? There's people you think, well, if I witness to them, they'll get saved. They, they don't get saved. And the person you think, I might as well not witness to them, and then they're the ones who get saved. There's something about it, about God's merciful grace. But what I'm interested in is not the in the effect on the unsaved as much as the effect on the saved. It's our defense to preach the gospel. What's the old saying? A good offense is a good defense. So by preaching the gospel of peace, it helps us retain our footing. So may God help us to just get that. What did Paul do in the room in the Philippian jail when they had him chained to the wall and they sang hymns all night, didn't they? And then the earthquake showed up, which meant God showed up. And then the jailer called for a light and he showed up. And he supposed the jailers were dead or escaped. And he took out his sword and he was going to kill himself right there. I don't know about you. Somebody put, somebody decorated my back with a whip and I was bleeding. I'd be very tempted to just sit there and watch. Be very tempted. Paul didn't take that temptation, did he? Do yourself no harm. We're all here. And I want to tell you, it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas was there. Every one of those prisoners that heard them sing, doors are open. Nobody ran for the door. They were all. And Paul took opportunity to preach the gospel of peace to the man who was so brutal to him. And God saved that man. Do yourself no harm, we're all here. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in your house. You see, these are precious things to learn. And Paul's, Paul's offense, as well as his defense in that situation, was preaching the gospel of peace. What if he'd let that man kill himself? How would that have looked in the morning to the authorities? You ever think about that? They'd have probably blamed Paul for that. I don't think Paul was being calculating. He was just being Paul. This man needs to, the gospel. It's a preaching the gospel of peace is a very good response to just about everything. And Satan's it's Satan that broke the peace. Satan broke the peace when he tempted Adam and Eve. And God will bruise Satan under your feet short, shortly, Paul told the Romans in Romans 16. And it's going to be the God of peace that does it. So let's, pe let's preach the gospel of peace. In the 1950s, most of you aren't that old, but Smitty and Tom <laughs> for that old Mike. I won't say about Nancy because I don't know. But do you remember the saying, some people were saying, better red than dead. That was an awful thing to say. They were basically saying, let's just cave in, let the, let the Russians have us. 
better read than dead. Uh, that's not a good thing. People now would say, better down than dead. I'll compromise. I'll step back. I'll give ground. No, no. We're told to stand. And we can't stand, and we can't stand. We've been told to stand about four times in this context, unless our feet are shod with the gospel. To people who may hear my voice of this message, have you embraced the gospel from the God of peace? Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you believed that gospel? Have you trusted that message? Do you know Jesus as your experience the peace of God that comes? And I'm not talking subjective. I'm talking about justified by faith and you have peace with God and you're as sure as heaven as if you were already there. You're legal. Paul told the Romans, yea, and I've strived to preach the gospel, 1520, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, or as it's written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they have not heard, shall understand, for which cause I've also been much hindered from coming to you. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you, wherefore, when I take my journey to Spain, I'll come to you, and I trust to see you in my journey, to be brought on my way there by you. If first I might somewhat be filled with your company, and now I go to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Paul was all about the gospel. He was all about God's truth. He fully preached the gospel of Christ, he says in verse 19. That was his offense, but it was also his defense. Everywhere he went. So may the Lord help us to do the same. Have you embraced the gospel of peace, are you still fighting with the enemy of God? Are we standing against satanic assaults? Are we going down because, in our minds, peace at any price? We're not talking about peace with God. We want peace with fallen men. We want peace with the enemy of peace Satan. So may God help us to stand and proclaim his word. Thank you, Father, for what we've looked at. Challenge us with the gospel of peace. May we not go out of this place barefoot. May our feet be shod with the gospel of peace. We've all fallen down at times. We've all have been overrun by temptation, Satan's deception. We've all failed to stand when we were told to stand. But help us now, as we think about the armor, to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. May we know it well. May we May we give it out when it's appropriate. We don't want to be obnoxious. We don't want to make. <coughs> we don't want to uh, annoy people to death. <coughs> but looking for opportunities, being gracious, being discreet, saying what we can say, we can't want to say. But at the right moment, at the right time, 
doing what we can to give out the gospel. And may we have our feet shod wherever we go. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, as we go from this place, loving you more, trusting you more, may the power of your love and the light of your word shine forth to a sin darkened.